um, and the floor is open. Anybody have any questions or points they want to make? Hi. Hi, Rod, uh, Rod Haswinkle. Um, I, in listening to the talks, I've heard some, I think, some, some common themes. Uh, so things like uh, the, the, the deposition patterns tend to reflect uh, local sources, um, uh, that there might be different, different sources in winter and in summer. Um, let's see, that, 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 that in summer, dust is, is an important factor. I, I, I wonder if, if this group of authors would, would consider that there's enough information now that you could produce sort of together a synthesis paper to sort of bring together all of this information to sort of tell a coherent story. I, is ours on? Yeah. Um, Matt, been, and I have, Matt and I have started talking about that, but I... Oh, yeah. were you going to jump in, Matt? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, we were just talking about that over beers the other, last night, right? Yeah. And so I think we're getting to that critical mass of the number of papers out there that we could probably start to weave together some, some common threads. So yes, I think the time is nigh or near. <laughs> there were certainly some nice links between all of the talks in the sense that almost every talk referenced another two of the talks. So there was a nice degree of integration through the mix for much of the day. So next question there. Uh, yes, uh, Bill Shottuck, University of Alberta. So Roland, uh, very nice work on vanadium and lithium. Uh, I get more excited about lead and antimony. And so what I love about your results, your lead peak is 1967. And unleaded gasoline was introduced 1976. So lead began its decline in the atmosphere before the introduction of unleaded gasoline. We see this in our peat cores in southern Ontario. Lead begins its decline at the end of the 1950s. Introduction, introduction of um, air pollution control technology and so on. And because you've got the antimony there, of course, antimony has a completely different source. Nothing to do with leaded gasoline. Having those two together says coal combustion, lead smelting, steel refineries, generation of submicron aerosols. So that's actually, as you know, what we would expect but really important information about the source of these heavy metals. And uh, Matt, in your presentation, you talked about dry deposition of coarse particles. And so I'm glad you did, because I think that hits the nail on the head, because around the oil sands region, that's what we're looking at, dry deposition of these coarse grain particles. So I just, I have a plea for everybody in their presentations, in their work, in their publications, in their reporting, to clearly distinguish between metals in the form of subgrain, uh, submicron aerosols from high temperature combustion processes and mechanically generated dusts that have a completely different particle size and completely different atmospheric transport properties. So I, I do see all of these results coming together beautifully. Thank you. I just wanted to make one quick comment on lead. You know, I, I sort of perused over it in the presentation, but you know, looking at the Fort Mackay lead data in the fine fraction, we see a very seasonal nature to that. And some of the preliminary lead isotope data seems to suggest Asian origin. So. Some of the, I think you're seeing, at least in the fine fraction lead, some, some material being transported into the region. Okay, Dan. Hello, uh, bear with me while I get my question um, prepared. It's kind of complex. Um, it's not so much related to the monitoring work that you've all done. I'm not a PhD in any one field, so I was able to follow some of it, but not others. But what I did pick up on was, uh, Colin, and I'll, I'll summarize yours first, but I have a number here. Uh, 
Colin, what I took away from yours was, in conclusion, and your conclusion number two at the end of your presentation was, um, so given what you said, the conclusion, how are we, or you, the royal you, um, informing your partners in IRMS? And that's the theme of my question. So what I took away from your presentation was the emission profile changes, the effects change, and we need to be adaptable to that kind of thing. If, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's generally what I took away from it. And surprise, surprise, in an IRMS system, and for those of you not familiar with IRMS, it's the integrated management system that's supposed to be overseeing all of what you're doing, and you're one part of it. But you have a great deal of minds here in the room that have done some, some scientific work, produced some results, and you're feeding it into a much larger system, not just producing papers and feeding universities. And then I'll, I'll change my comment next to you, Kelly. Um, participation and discussion is important. Just summary, that's my words, not yours. But it's generally important to the process. And, but we have a system that shuts us down, particularly indigenous communities, shuts us down completely from even raising concerns. So how do we filter that into the IRMS discussion if you can't have those discussions anywhere? Matt, what I took from yours was, um, what I liked best about yours was very simply for me, is you showed a graph in 3D that, um, for, as a former employee of Fort Mackay, um, is daily life. And I'm glad you captured it in a 3D model and, and showed that that cloud sits in that riverbed. And that's something we experienced every day when I worked out there, when I had complaints. And to me, you put it in a way that people can understand it, and non-technical people can understand that that was important. And then Alvaro was absolutely right when he said this, this group, and when we started in the early days of Jossum, this was an important piece of work because it was the last line of defense when all the systems were put against indigenous communities in the oil sands. And you know, we were hoping that some of the work that you were all going to do, like Matt's graph, was going to validate the concerns that the communities had. Uh, Roland um, made the statement, monitoring often comes too late. We're 40 years in, we've got four years, I think, was on the invitation for Jossum, uh, that you're four years into this process. And then I compare that to what I see the government of Alberta doing. And you've got provincial ministers flying all over the globe promoting, you know, climate change this, climate change that. But the local issues that we experience are more than climate change. And we don't see any traction from the government as a whole on that particularly as it relates to the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan, several years out from the panel report, and the comment we got from our minister was, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so it's a very complex um, system that we're in, and you all are, are doing some cutting edge work and giving answers to complex questions. So my question really is, how do you get this information? And I'm assuming it's Fred Rona. But how do you get this into Fred so Fred can actually see the policy changes that our keynote speaker was trying to talk about? Because there's a few of us in this room that are growing very frustrated with the pace in which things change, especially after you get shut out. So how do you get Fred to get the information in the most simplistic way so that it can make sense to people? Because even last week, we have a meeting, uh, the Wabia board met with members of government and it was a very frustrating conversation. And it seems like the message is not going through. <laughs> Stuart's looking at me. I guess as co-chair, I get to have the first stab there. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to respond, but I will comment on the source apportionment stuff because I think it's, it's an important piece of JOSAM and of a lot of the research that's been presented today. And I think that um, there's absolutely no doubt that sources have changed through time and that the relative importance of those sources have changed through time. But I don't think we've sort of completely figured that out yet. And I think figuring that out is really important because once you know what the sources are and their relative importance, then maybe some of the decisions that need to be made about those sources will become a little bit easier. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the work that, that John Martin's group published where they, they provided pretty compelling evidence that the pet coke piles were an important source of PAHs in the region using some of the moss samples. But, you know, if you look at the lichen data and the work that, that Matt and Wabia have done, um, it doesn't really support that. And, and there's no 
strong evidence to, or strong indication as to which one is right or, or why there's a little bit of a, di a disagreement there as to what the most important source of pHs is, are. And it's not a seasonal thing because lichens and moss are collected and they represent the same season. So is it an, is it an archive thing? Is it, is it reflecting something how these two um, receptors behave in the environment? We don't know. And I think, I think, you know, as an example, figuring that out is probably an important thing to tackle. I'll stick my foot in it a little bit here. Um, the, uh, one of the consulting reports on water quality and, uh, and fish and benthic sampling from last year was a, it was about a million dollar contract. It was a 2,000 page report. So at 50 million a year, that's about 100,000 pages of reports per year if you're going to read them all. And for scientific papers, it's taking years for the data to get amalgamated and come out. And I think we need some sort of a paradigm shift in terms of how the data is communicated and accessed um, to speed up the pace at which, and as you said, the simplicity with which. That's one of the reasons I put the, the water flow data for the USGS up. If we can get to a system where the data goes up quicker in a, in a way that is easily interpreted and you can look at patterns over time and anyone can do it, then we'll get to a place where the data will be more easily translated for other purposes. But it's, it's the, the pace of the, the data coming out in the format that it comes out, which, which is, I think needs a bit of a paradigm shift. Okay, there's a question here. Sure. Uh, Gary Millard with Shell Canada. I heard some attention paid today to mercury concentrations, uh, and I heard some different comments about its behavior through time, the history of its concentrations, and a source apportionment. Can whatever relevant members of the panel discuss sort of their views on, on mercury in the uh, Athabasca region? Uh, okay, uh, so I showed some snowpack uh, mercury loadings. Um, so we do see that, you know, elevation in loadings of both uh, total mercury, which includes all forms of mercury, and the methylmercury, um, you know, within the vicinity of the major developments. Um, but I think the contradictions or differing things you're hearing are your... Um, referring to is the fact that Colin and the sediment cores um, doesn't really see an increase over time um, that he can attribute to industrial development within the region. Right, is that fair, Colin? Yeah, no, that's fair. And, and um, yeah, so um, some of the work that we are doing in the, with, was first to try and attribute the sources of the methylmercury in the snow. Um, and as I said, we can't uh, see a signal where, uh, I mean, there's no indication that the methylmercury in the snow uh, is produced within the snowpacks, and it's not coming from pet coke. So I can tell you what it's not from, um, but I don't know what it is from. I mean, we're, we're trying to go down the list, so to speak. Hi, Margaret Luger with Mixed Creek First Nation. Um, thank you very much for all the, the presentations today. They were very informative. Um, as I look at the, at the screen and look at the Oil Sand Science Symposium, uh, it gets me thinking that some of the questions and some of the work we're doing may be through the wrong lens. So we talk about the Oil Sand Science Symposium and the focus is <laughs> the oil sands and not so much uh, the science. So what I heard in a lot of the presentations today was more about um, what contaminants are there, um, what are the sources, is it or isn't it industry. What I didn't hear was the concerns from the people on the ground, from the communities, uh, hearing what their concerns are and doing studies and assessments based on those concerns. So we heard an example today of Fort Mackay um, saying that they were experiencing issues with air emissions and odors. And in order for Fort Mackay to get any attention on that issue, 
they had to develop their own station and bring their own science to the table to get acknowledgement um, of their issue. So that's a general comment, and when we're looking at um, these issues, what lens are we looking at these issues from? Is it, is it to focus on development and whether um, sources are from development or not? Or is it because we're concerned about the people that are there and finding answers for the people that are actually there experiencing or potentially affected by these issues? So the question I have for the panel is, um, in your individual work, um, how have you integrated TEK, and it could be a simple um, no, we haven't, or yes, we have, and how you think um, you can do that in, in your work? Um, that was uh, well, well phrased uh, comments and, and questions. I, I had one slide up there about the work that we've been doing with the residents of Fort Chippewyan because um, they contacted us early on. Um, it was actually Bruce McLean who contacted us with the Miccosu Cree First Nation and he said, listen, people are, are interested here in the snowpack work that you're doing and can, can we get in on this? And we said absolutely. So, I mean, that was relatively easy and, and we're, we're open to doing that kind of work with, with other groups, anybody else who's interested. And the, the sites that we targeted um, in the Peace Athabasca Delta were based on, on sites where the people wanted to have samples taken. So they essentially chose those sites. And, it, and now we're coordinating it with their um, muskrat population surveys that they do, they do up there. So um, coming from a group that does a lot of Arctic work, I think that you know we have a lot of experience with uh, with community engagement in our group anyways, and um, it's something that we, we enjoy doing. Uh, uh, Kamrul from Alberta Environment and Parks. Uh, rather than a broader strategic question, just a uh, short uh, technical specific question to uh, Xiao Meng. Uh, regarding the air campaign, uh, it's a wonderful set of data we can see. And when you uh, have the box formed, uh, we can see that the plume is intercepted mainly uh, in one wall, most of the cases, uh, in some cases two walls. So my uh, uh, question is, uh, uh, have you ever thought of uh, drawing another wall uh, downwind, maybe 10 kilometers away or something, so that you can get more comprehensive analysis of the estimation, uh, addressing the lifetime and all the uh, decaying issues like that? Thank you. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, indeed, we actually have different uh, design of the flights. Uh, we actually, um, uh, the water, the, the boxes that are shown in, the, in, the, in this talk was designed for the uh, determine the emissions, not just, not just for the VOCs, but also PM 2.5 and PM 10, as well as PM, PM 1, which we are in the process of uh, analyzing that data set. Um, those, are the, those are the design patterns designed for, to determine the emission rate. But we also have what we call transformation flights in which we uh, successively uh, create successive uh, uh, screens, if you will, or walls. Uh, each uh, displays roughly about one hour's downwind of the other. So we, in those flights, we typically will create three to four, up to five. Um, uh, five screens, so we could actually track the same air mass plume and look at the uh, chemical, uh, not, only in term, uh, not only the chemical transformation products and the rate at which how these products are formed, but also the, uh, through mass balance, we are able to now determine the, um, the, the amount of, say, uh, compounds, say, sulfur in the case, um, Look at it, see what, how they can be lost from the air through the right position. Yes. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, Paul, uh, Paul's uh, presentation actually had a slide to show that. Yeah, that, that was the, uh, the one where we were talking about acid catalyzed aerosol formation, and there were a couple of uh, different plumes, an organic plume and an SF2 plume. So it, look, it looks sort of like almost like a ladder in terms of the, the profiles downwind. That, that was an example of one of those sort of flights. OK. 
Okay, I think there was a question here. Hi, Monique Dube. I'm the Chief Environmental Scientist with AER. I just want to go back to the previous question. Um, just for clarity, I do want to give an example of how the excellent work of some of the people at the table up there has helped us at the regulator and also the community of Fort Mackay, both the First Nations and the Métis, and it's related to the air quality and the odors that you're speaking of. So as you know, it's been a significant issue in the community for decades. And uh, as a result, we implemented a study over the last year that integrated the data from the Fort Mackay First Nation and Métis, the Environment Canada and Climate Change Station at Oskiotin, the Wabia data, the uh, information from industry that submitted to us, the regulator, as well as to NPRI. And as a result of that, a report was publicly released on September 21st with 17 recommendations that get to not only the gaps, and these are gaps every agency and stakeholder that was involved has fully endorsed, as has the government of Alberta, fully endorsed all recommendations. So lead agencies include Environment Canada and Climate Change, FRED's team, uh, the AEP Policy Division, AER, um, and so we'll be moving forward on those gaps. The first task force meeting is scheduled for December 7th in the community of Fort Mackay. We could never have done it if this program hadn't existed and the excellence at that research station in the community of Fort Mackay. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not about identifying gaps, it's about getting to solutions. So this really looked at those air emissions and odors relative to um, national and international thresholds for chronic human health and odors. Um, it's co-authored that report with Alberta Health and AER. It's on our website and I think it's an excellent example um, of a good start of using this scientific information to make a difference. Of course, the, the, the real truth will be in the action, uh, which is um, working with industry and the regulator to get to solutions to make a difference in the community. But so far, all parties have been at the table and it's, and it's been positive. So I just wanted to provide that clarification so that people understood that there are examples out there of where we're trying to, to take step forward to make a difference to the people in this, uh, in this room and specific communities. That's great, thank you. I think we have time for one last question. There was a lady here. Sorry. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm sorry, there was somebody before me. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Me? Okay. Uh, my name is Melody Lapine and I'm a, a member of the Miccosukee Cree First Nation uh, from Fort Chippewan. I guess I just want to uh, ask a question of the entire panel because this question comes up quite uh, regularly in my community is based on the information, based on the data and the science that in your research, um, can the indigenous communities, specifically us downstream and, and maybe members in Fort Mackay as well, is can we con con continue to, to consume our, our traditional uh, resources? We eat muskrat, duck, uh, caribou, moose meat. I guess in terms of your level of, level of confidence in your research and the data and the results of the work that you're doing, um, can you provide, uh, I guess, a response to some of the local communities in terms of consumption of their traditional foods? Is anybody comfortable answering that question? No, I, I mean, I, I'll pick up the microphone just because I've been making measurements of contaminants in, in the Delta in, in areas of land where, where people, the people of Fort Chippewan go and collect fish and, and hunt. I, I don't know anything about the levels of contaminants in the food they eat. I haven't measured them and, I, you know, I, I am aware that studies have been doing them, but I, I don't really know the outcome of them. Uh, the only thing I can say based on our research is that the, the levels of the contaminants in in the lakes that we see and the, the ramp data from surface sediment in the river have not changed. Um, they're, not, they're not more concentrated than they used to be in the past. And, and so, I mean, it's hard to make a, a link there, but, but if it was safe to eat, you know, 200, 300 years ago, the levels haven't in, increased in the, in the sediment um, that is a major route for contaminants in, into at least the aquatic organisms. 
that's about as far as I can say, but I certainly can't tell you whether it's safe to eat or not, or whether it ever was safe to eat or not. 